I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 24. And I'm going to preach from Isaiah 24 all the way through Isaiah 26. Um, and I believe the Lord wants to say a few things. I'll give you a second to get there. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. Now, do not fear when I read these passages. It's not meant to frighten anybody. It's got a good ending, as all the Word of God does. Behold, the earth, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its service and scatters abroad its inhabitants, and it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the master, as with the maid, so with his mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The, look, the land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken his word. The earth mourns and fades away. The haughty people of the earth language, the earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant, therefore the curse has devoured the earth. And those who dwell in it are desert, desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. The new wine fails, the vine languishes, the merry-hearted sigh, the myrrh of the tambourine ceases, the noy of the jubilant ends. The joy of the harp ceases, he shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may go in. There is a cry for wine in the streets, the jo all joy is darkened. The mirror of the land is gone. In the city of desert, des desolation is left, and the gate is stricken with destruction. It shall be like the shaking of an olive tree, like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. I'll go on. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth, and it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who comes up from the pit in the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare for the windows for on high are open and the foundations are shaken they shall lift up their voice they shall sing verse 14 for the majesty of the lord they shall cry aloud from the sea therefore glorify the lord in the dawning light the name of the Lord God of Israel in the coastlands of the sea. From the ends of the earth we have heard songs, glory to the righteous. But he said, I am ruined, ruined, woe to me. The treacherous dealers, the treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Indeed, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Chapter 25. O Lord, you are my God. I'll exalt you. I'll praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Chapter 26, in that day, this song will be heard in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks, open the gates, that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. So you trust in the Lord forever. For in Yah, the Lord is strength, everlasting strength, for he's bring down those who dwells on high. Verse 7 of chapter 26. The way of the righteous is upright, almost upright. You weigh the path of the just. Yes, in the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you. The desire of your soul is for the name and for the remembrance of you. With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let grace be shown to the wicked yet he will not learn righteousness. I, I, I read that passage, and you can read the whole bit at home, I encourage you to, because I think it's important to know, to, to not only understand uh, the goodness of God in this generation, but to have an understanding of what I believe, what I believe at this stage God is doing. And uh, sometimes people have preached messages where, well, the enemy's doing this, and God has taken by surprise, and now God's going to react. But the Word of God teaches us that God is sovereign over the affairs of men. And he is totally in control of everything that happens on earth, ultimately. And so, and we know that all that he does, all these purposes are good. 
But sometimes, you know, I've heard things said that God's great interest is in your prosperity, your peace, your health. Everything's about you and just keeping your personal happiness. Well, God does want us to be happy and joyful and peaceful, but there is a bigger, God has a bigger agenda. Do you know what God's great passion is? God's number one passion, it is righteousness. And, and the reason why God's passion is righteousness is that all his goodness and blessing comes through righteousness. You can't have peace and joy in your life until you your conscience is cleaned, your guilt is washed away, your shame is removed. But when you come to Christ and trust in the, the, the sanctified blood of Jesus, you are forgiven, you are reconciled with God. And at that point, you are made positionally righteous. And then the experience of peace and joy can follow. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. But you cannot experience peace and joy until you become positionally right with God. So all the blessings, the righteous are as bold as a lion. The righteous are blameless and their children are blessed. Righteousness is spiritual armor. Righteousness exalts a nation, lifts a nation up. So God's great passion and desire is that we individually and the world would live before him in righteousness, and righteousness just means doing what is right before God. Blessed are they. The real Christian, the real Christian, has an agenda and a prayer life that is beyond just fix me, help me. It is, there is a cry in the real Christian's heart, and I believe this cry has been going to heaven for a number of years now, and it's a cry of righteousness. It's, oh God, I'm grieved like, like Noah was, and and, and, and many men of God in the past, they're grieved by all the like, righteous lot of all the rubbish and all the nonsense and all the wickedness that goes on around us. They've been crying out for God to bring a movement of righteousness on earth. And uh, I believe that our generation is the most unrighteous generation that has ever lived on earth. You, you just cannot be, uh, you know, over the last, particularly over the last 40 years or whatever, you know, uh, my sister there, Anne, just prayed about, uh, you know, the trafficking of children. Our generation takes innocent children and kidnaps them from their home and sells them into sex slavery. The horror of all that is I can't even dwell and I can't even think about it. It is so bad. Our generation, when I was in Uganda, and you, 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 we've had just Pastor David here, you know he's a man of truth. He said, in Uganda, they're finding children slaughtered in villages with their organs stolen. This is what has been happening on planet Earth for the last 40 years. And, and what's happening is men are saying, in the midst of all this, this wickedness, we don't want to hear from God. You know, in the U.S. and other countries, we want God out of the schools. We want God out of our courts. We don't want to hear about God. We actually don't want to hear about the morality of God, how God says we should live uh, in, in love towards one another, what, what God says is good. We are a generation who actually wants to say evil is good and good is evil and get lost, God. That's what our generation has said. We want to define, uh, uh, the, the Bible says that here, there's a generation, and I believe Isaiah speaks to the the last days that have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth. If ever there's been a generation, a haughty people, who have transgressed the Lord as God, changed the ordinance, broken the covenant, the everlasting covenant. And, and see, uh, this is the generation we live in. You know, broken the everlasting covenant. Marriage is a covenant. And they say, no, we don't want the covenant the way God desires anymore between a man and a woman that produces children. We want to change that, that anyone can have a covenant, men and men and women and women. And, and we want to bring it, you know, it says here, that the, the speaks about in, in verse 10 of chapter 24, the city of confusion is broken down. If ever there's been a city or nations in confusion, it's ours. We're actually telling little children, you, you know, your gender, 
when you're born. You know, your genitalia doesn't determine whether you're a boy or a girl. You're a boy, but you may be a girl, or you're a girl, you may be a boy, and everybody is just confused. There is such confusion. And, and, and Isaiah, this passage in Isaiah that I speak of, prophesies of a people who will defile the earth because they transgress God's laws, they change his ordinance, they break his everlasting covenant, they bring a city in confusion, and it says that in one moment the Lord makes the earth empty. He scatters abroad its inhabitants. Uh, and, and, and I believe this passage is speaking about the end time judgments of God that's going to come upon the earth. And it says when they come, he's going to close all festivities down, the, the mirth of the tambourine sees, strong, uh, the joy of the harp ceases. So all the sports, all the entertainments closed down. Every house is shut up that none may go in. And uh, the new wine fails. Uh, it says that, the, and, and, and the, when... The judgment of God comes. It says that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. He who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open. The foundations of the earth are shaken. It's like that's saying one thing after another is going to keep coming. And I believe, the reason I believe we're in a season of judgment is that I believe this nation, when it changed the ordinance of God, particularly about marriage, uh, what has happened is that we first see an extraordinary drought. Extra unprecedented doubt. Then we had unprecedented fires. One up. Now we've got an unprecedented virus. And the reason I believe it's judgment is because in, in God's judgments, there was always mercy. Can you imagine what had happened if this, this virus had happened in the midst of the fires? But it didn't. But I believe, and I believe that, uh, that what we're seeing now is, is the earth, this passage is um, speaking about the judgment of God coming upon the earth. And, uh, and, and cities being shut up, um, it, it just goes on and on and on. Um, the treacherous being dealt with, uh, you know, tr the wicked being trampled down, it says. I could just go on and on in here. Um, the, hum the, pr the proud are being pulled down into a humble place. The terrible ones are being diminished and... and I believe we're seeing a, a season where we're starting to see the, the judgments that God promised would precede the end, the birth pains before the end of all things. We're starting to see them. And, and you start to see them breaking out over the earth. And this, that when the judgment comes, it says that, that they'll be like an equalizer. It says, uh, just so with the servant, it will be the same with the master. With the maid, so with the mistress. With the creditor, with the borrower. You know, you notice when these viruses come, there's no rich and poor. There's no, everyone's brought to the same level when the judgment of God comes down. And says, when the judgment of God comes, it's like the shaking of an olive tree. People get shaken because all the things they've trusted in start to totter. The economies or whatever. And, you know, for God to shake the earth, he, he doesn't want to, he's cried out to this, this world for 100 years, 120 years since Azusa Street, the last move of God. He's cried out and cried out mercifully, come back to me, come back to me, turn away from your wickedness, come back to me, come back to me, come back, turn away from these wicked things, come back, come back and serve your God. I've got the way for you to live successfully. He's cried out and cried out and cried out, but God, what will have, when, the, when this wickedness is, keeps, um, man keep getting more and more wicked and darker and darker, what happens in the midst of that darkness? There is a people that are crying out saying, oh God, no more. And in the end, God's mercy and his grace is set aside and he has to release judgment on the earth. But there's a purpose in his judgment. I want to say this. Verse 9 of 26 says, With my soul I have desired you in the night, with my spirit within me I have sought your word. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let grace be shown to the wicked, and he will not learn righteousness. So there's a great purpose when judgment comes. It is, it is to bring the wicked out of control. It is to close down wicked establishments. It's to remove and shake the world so that uh, 
people see there is a God who is in control and they're not in control. And for many people to repent and turn away from wickedness, turn away from darkness and turn back to Christ, who is the righteous one, have their sin forgiven and become right with God again. That is the purpose of judgment. That is what, God, what I believe God is doing today in the world, that he's actually restoring the judgments that we're seeing come upon the world. He is actually restoring the world to a righteous position. He's begun to. And in this passage, you see why all this destruction is going on. When, 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 um, when the world languishes, when the earth is defiled, when, because of everyone's transgression. And uh, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. It says, few are left. The wine fails. The vine languishes. The, 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 the myrrh of the tambourine ceases. In the midst of this judgment, this is so amazing. The verse 14, there's this group of people. And it says, they shall lift up their voice. They shall sing. For the majesty of your Lord, they shall cry aloud from the sea. Therefore glorify the Lord in the dawning light. The name of the Lord, the God of Israel in the coastlands of the sea. For the ends of the earth have heard songs. Glory to the righteous. Verse 25 says, O Lord, you are my so God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Chapter 26. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates of the righteous nation who keeps truth may enter in. So in the midst of judgment, there is this group of people, and I believe it is clearly the remnant end time church who know their God, and when they see the judgments of God, they are not dismayed, they are not in fear, but there's this voice and this song coming up, this shout coming up, it's from the ends of the earth. It is, it, it is Egyptians, it is, it is Nigerians, it is Australians, it is South Americans, all this remnant church who know their God and they are not shaken, they are saying glorify the Lord. They're singing, singing aloud, glorify the Lord, glorify the Lord. Why are they singing? Why are they praising God in the midst of when everyone else is terrified? I tell you what, they are praising God because they know their God and they know when judgment comes. It's for wickedness to be closed down, but it's not for the righteous. It says, to, to, to chapter 26, it says, uh, in that day, his song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates to the righteous nation, which keeps the truth may enter in. And you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That's the same thing as, as, as Psalm, Psalm 91 says. He who dwells in the shadow of the secret place of the Most High shall abide under his wings, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my God in whom I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowl and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. A thousand may fall at your right hand side, ten thousand at your left. But the, 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 the deadly pestilence that walks in darkness shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look on it because you have made the Lord your God your refuge. So there's a group of people crying and saying, God, you're on the move, but, but we, are, we have come under the blood of Jesus. We've become righteous. The judgment is not on us because we have accepted Christ, he, he, you who made no sin for us, that we could become the righteousness of God. We are in him. And just as the, as the Egyptians, when the, the judgment of God fell, Sorry, the Hebrews, when the judgment of God fell on the Egyptians, because they had blood over their doorposts, it didn't touch them. So there's a group of people that are actually crying and they're actually shouting, God, your judgment is falling, but we are not in fear because we are under the blood. We are the people with the, the, with the hail falls on Egypt, but it doesn't fall in Goshen. We are the people when it's darkness in Egypt, it's still light for God's people. We are the apple of your eye. Judgment is not for us. We shall only see it. On your, and it's very, very important, church, that that be your position at this time. That you start praising God that you're a protected people. And this, this, this voice is crying out, this, this, this revival church is crying out, because there's a people, did you know, in the midst of the wickedness, the darkness, there's a people that have not been just praying for themselves. There's a people that says, um, oh Lord, yes, in the way of your judgments, 
chapter 26, verse 8, we have waited for you. People who've been waiting on God, who've been praying for God, saying, God, do something against this wickedness. The blood of the children, the blood of the innocent is crying out to heaven. God, move. We have tried everything. We have prayed, but we've not been able to bring deliverance. But we need a God, an almighty God, who can shut things down, who can bring judgment on wickedness. Bring things back into the way God intended uh, when he placed Adam in the garden. It was a righteous place. And so it's the people that have been praying and they're shouting because when they see the judgments, they said, we've waited for this. And in the midst of judgment, in the midst of judgment, there is revival. We see people coming to Christ. We see when your judgments are in the world, the people will learn righteousness. We see people coming under conviction and knowing that there's something that's different in the world. The, the fires, the floods, the locusts, the viruses, that God is behind this. And they start to repent of their sins and, and, and seek out God for forgiveness and realize that God has shed his son so they can be forgiven there is in the midst of this there's a people that understand what God is doing and he's bringing judgment but he's also bringing a great revival a great harvest of righteousness coming to the earth when your judgments are in the world the people will learn righteousness many people are going to be shaken many people are going to be fearful many people are going to be questioning why they've ignored God in this age many people are going to start uh, uh, trembling under this age as, as the world is shaken and there are going to be people like my daughter's testimony people like you and I who can say the reason you're afraid is because you don't know God you don't have a covering and you will say I I I have, a, I have a place where I, where I, where I have perfect peace. And you're going to say, how do you get this? You're going to say, well, the reason you don't have perfect peace is because you've ignored God all your life. But if you turn to God, he'll become righteousness and peace and joy will become your experience. There is a revival of righteousness that God is bringing Amen. now in the midst of the judgment. And God's people can see it. Chapter 25, verse 2, so you have made a city of ruin, a fortified city of ruin, a pl palace of foreigners to be a city no more, will never be revealed. Therefore, the strong people will glorify you. The city of the terrible nations will fear you. Will fear you. People will fear God again. They will revere God again. They will say, we're not really in control. Uh, we can't really determine our own morality. There is a God who we're accountable for, who controls all things. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So people see that God is answering our prayer. We're not only protected, but God is answering our prayers. And they say, these people, that they're confident. Because in, in chapter uh, 26, verse or 25, verse 2, it says, You have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in distress, a refuge from the storm, a strayed from the heat. They're praising God because what God has been to them in the past. There are people here, and many of God's people, that they've been through stuff before. They've been through storms. Like, they've been in, 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 in times where they've seen the judgment of God fall before, but they've been protected, like Noah in his ark. The same, he says here, he says, uh, about the needy, he says, For you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm. We've already seen that in our lives. We've been in places where we've been, we've been, we've been uh, distressed. We've been in fear, but we've experienced God's perfect love and his protection and his deliverance in the past. So we're praising God for what he's, what he's done in the past. We're praising God for what he's doing now. He's bringing a, a revival of righteousness. And this passage goes on to speak about, The dead shall live together with my dead. The dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise awake and seeing you who dwell in the dust. There's a people who, 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 who know that God protects them from judgment. There's a people who, who know uh, what God has done in the past. But there's also a people who are praising God for the future. That death is not the end for God's people. We are already uh, risen in Christ. We are already resurrected people. And, and the future for me to live to die, for Christ to die is gain. That, that we are always optimistic and we are always positive because we are not afraid in the fear of death. Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing you who dwell in the dust. So we praise God and we sing to God because 
We have a protected place. We sing to God because we see what he's doing on the earth today. The Bible says here, we see what, is, what our future is. We are people of resurrection. Death is not the end for us. For live, to live is Christ, to die is gain. But it says here in, in the midst of um, th- this season where ju- judgment comes and nations are learning righteousness and they're turning away from their wickedness. It speaks about here, um, you have increased the nation, O Lord. You have increased the nation. You are glorified. You have expanded all the borders. And I believe that out of this, out of this season, and it's a season of, of people seeing the nation change, the world change, the judgment of God's beginning to fall. There is going to be a move of righteousness. There's going to be a turn to Christ. And Christ's people and Christ's church is going to expand at this time, not diminish. It's going to expand and increase because people are going to turn. They're going to turn to God. They're going to turn from their wickedness in this way. They're going to realize at some level. And, and, and the church may even get worse with, with, uh, with, with Egypt. God spent, sent many judgments upon Egypt. But before he did a great act of deliverance, before he moved in that nation as he'd never moved before, the judgments were just a precursor. But, but I believe that we're going to see uh, uh, a mighty revival come out of this. Or even in the midst of it, we're going to see a great revival. And that we are not shaken because we understand that when your judgments are in the earth, the people learn righteousness. i tell you why we can also sing. We can also sing Because if any of God's people ever get afflicted by sickness, if any of God's people ever get get afflicted, there is a a balm in Gilead. I want to show you Numbers chapter 21, God's people are walking through the wilderness. And some sin, some of them grumble against God and complain and start to accuse God of not being good to them. And it says that they were bitten. And they were bitten by serpents and they had a poison. And they couldn't do anything about it. They realized they were powerless in the face of the poison. Some of us have been not bitten by the corona thing. We've been bitten by fear. That's what the enemy wants to bite. Who is the serpent wants to bite you with? But, you know, as God's people, as soon as they turned and came to Moses and said, we've been afflicted, God said, I love my people so much. Start boiling the gold. And they put the gold, and they begin to melt the gold. The solution was that they would lift up this, they would make a serpent, they would lift up this serpent in the middle of the desert. And God said, everyone who's been afflicted, everyone who's been afflicted, they had to come to Moses, confess their sin, And he said, everyone who looks at that thing that's been lifted up for the purpose of salvation, everyone who looks at that serpent with faith, a miracle's going to happen. And it did. When they looked at all the people who were bitten and, and dying and afflicted, when they looked at what God lifted up for the purpose of salvation, when they looked at that thing, that serpent, in faith, the death in them was destroyed and new life was imparted to them. And Christ says, just as a serpent was lifted up in the desert, I will be lifted up. Everyone who looks to Christ in faith, there's a continual move of resurrection, abundant, eternal life that flows from him to you and all manner of death is always destroyed for those who trust in him. So there is a provision Christ has already made provision for all sickness, all affliction. He has already been lifted up. That when we're afflicted with anything, even fear, we look to him in faith. Everything that is death, everything that is hurting us, everything is destroyed. And Christ imparts his new life to those who trust him. So we have a... We have a God whose ways are way above our ways. He is not Father Christmas, but all his ways are good. Everything he does in the world is good. And and I believe that our God is on the move, that our God is answering about 18 years 
for myself but others, of prayer that our God is shaking, but his purposes are so wonderful. It's to shut down evil. It's to deal with drug dealers, pedophiles that prey on children, all these things. It's, it's actually to remove when my judgments in the world, the people will learn righteousness. But church, what God, the Holy Spirit said to me today is to say, he, he wants, in the midst of this, he wants us to join in because there's a remnant church that's been in the spirit, that's been in the secret place in prayer, that knows what God is doing, knows what he's up to, and he wants our song to be heard. He wants a praise to be coming out of us saying, God, you've already saved us, redeemed the word of the blood. When judgment falls, it's never for your people. We are protected and believe. Psalm 91, that we are in the secret place. We have come into the dwelling, which is Christ, that the blood is already over. The 10,000 will fall at our left. That we'll actually see judgment fall, but it will not touch us. He wants us to believe and praise him that we are, we are, his, we are his beloved church. We are protected churches. And also praise him that he's dealing with unrighteousness. This is what's behind the, the judgment. He is, de- he is planning and he is on the move against unrighteousness that God is moving in our generation. I believe we can't see it yet, fully yet, but we will see in the midst of this, we're going to see a great revival. We're going to see people turning to Christ because He is the only one through who we can become righteous through His blood, through trusting in His blood. There are going to be people turning to Christ in masses at the moment and God is going to increase His church. He's not going to diminish it in this church. God's purposes are just so wonderful in the midst of it all. And that you know he's going to protect you because he's protected you in the past. And we can praise him because even if Christians get sick, Christ has been lifted up. Christ has been lifted up. And as we look to him, he is our savior. He is our healer. He is our deliverer. He provided mercy in the wilderness for his people. He provides mercy in the midst of judgment. Even today, there is mercy always for God's people. So we, I I just know God wants a people. He wants you, you know, I'm going to pray before we go because the enemy is trying to, I believe the enemy is trying to bite people with fear. He may not have bitten you with this virus, but he's biting people with fear. I'm going to pray that we not be a people of fear, but we be a people of praise. I'm telling you, he's looking for praise from his people. And there's a song, it's rising up from Ethiopia, it's rising up from Panama, it's rising up all around the world from a spirit-filled remnant church that's been grieved for what's been happening in the land over the years and are starting to pray that God is on the move. You know, this passage, is, it just finishes. And it says, uh, I love this passage. It says, your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing. Come, my people, enter into your chambers, shut your doors behind you. I believe that's a place of prayer. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the judgment is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also her blood, disclose her blood and will no more cover her head. I believe that speaks about, we haven't seen it yet, the judgments are different to the tribulation. There's a time where God says that, um, I'm not trying to make people fear, but play. Dreadful proportion will come upon the earth. Earthquakes will be happening everywhere. And this is the, the great tribulation. But he says, that's not for my people. Come, my people, enter your chamber. Shut your doors behind you until the indignation is past. For the Lord comes out of his place. He's going to take and punish the inhabitants of the earth because judgment is never for God's people. You can rejoice. If you're a Christian, you're under the blood, you've trusted in the blood, you can fear nothing because the judgments are not for you. They will not touch you. The Bible says with your eyes you'll only see them. Only see them. Do you believe that? If you believe it, there's going to be a song coming out of this church.
There's going to be a song that's actually heard all around the world. Let me read about what uh, Revelation chapter 7 says. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which nobody could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm, beach, palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. All the elders stood around the throne. And the elders of our four living creatures and fell to their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessed the glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And I said to him, Sir, you know, he said to me, Then one of the elders answered and said to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And he said, Sir, you know, he said to me, They're the ones who come out, out of the great tribulation, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Maybe you've come here for the first time. And maybe you haven't got a song, but you've got a lot of fear in your heart. I want to sort of bow our heads. And I want to pray for you. There is a place. It's not called religion. There is a place of relationship that God has and desires you to come into. A, a place where you dwell and abide in Christ. It's only when you're in that place you can say, the Lord is my refuge. And the only way you come into that place is through repenting of your sin, turning from all your personal wickedness, all the lies, all the cheating, all the wrong that you've known you're done. And you come to Christ and you say, I need to be forgiven. And I accept that you love me and you died on the cross. You shed your blood that I could be forgiven. But I today turn away from my sin and I turn to you. I turn to you. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. If you need to do that today, if you need to do that, I want to raise your hand to God and you'll come under the shadow of his wings. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you that you are bringing salvation even now. And you are going to have a people who are covered. Who will say in the midst of the judgment, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust.